Welcome to Let's Face the Facts, the rewatch podcast for the classic sitcom, The Facts of Life. Join us each week as we synopsize, analyze, criticize, and ultimately idolize the show. And now, here's your host of Let's Face the Facts, the wonderful David Almeida! Thank you, Matthew Arder. Welcome back to another show, another week. Thank you for downloading and pressing play. I have so much good news this week. I am just, I am bursting with excitement. First bit of good news, our guest this week is Ken Reed. Ken is, of course, the host of the amazing podcast, TV Guidance Counselor. On very short notice, I was able to grab a hold of him. I thought this would be a really fun episode to have him do because... We know from when he was on the show before that he really, really is into the over our heads years. So it was so much fun that we got to talk with him. I got to introduce him to Matthew. The second bit of good news is uh, my friend and former guest of the pod, Dr. Steve Summers, texted me the other night and said, hey, the Roku channel has rotated their offerings again in July. And as of the beginning of this month, Seasons 7, 8, and 9 are available on the Roku channel. And you can get to that with setting up a free account. And uh, if you have an actual Roku device, you can stream it directly there onto your TV. But otherwise, now it is really, really easy to get a hold of them on your computer. And the quality is so much better. And these are the full-length versions, not the syndicated, edited-down versions. So... Thank you for discovering that for me, Dr. Steve. And lastly, I need to welcome a new Tutti Fruity, Doug W. Hey, Doug, this is your official shout out. Doug has joined the ranks of folks who support the show through Patreon. If you wish to do the same, check out the show notes. You will find the link there. In the meantime, let us all welcome Doug W. to the family. Anyway, moving on to this week, Ken Reed joined me and Matthew in watching Season 7, Episode 8, Come Back to the Truck Stop, Natalie Green, Natalie Green, and the original air date was November 9th of 1985. I think we're ready to jump on in. Let's face the facts with Ken Reed. Well, Ken Reed, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm very a excited to be back. Three Pete guests, third time. Matthew should be joining us shortly. I see him. There he is. Oh, there he is. Hi. You see how this is, Ken? He rarely even acknowledges my existence. <laughs> now he'll so good to see you and <laughs> know you. Oh my God. He'll just I... go and then you show up when you show up. <laughs> I listen so regularly, Ken. I'm just such a big fan. Of oh, your thank show. you. Thank you. Is that an Emmy behind you, by the way? Oh, my God. That is crazy. You would bring that up. Oh, my God. Yes, <laughs> it is. I am, I am an Emmy Award owner. Yes. Oh, what did you win for? I didn't say I won. I said I own. Well, yeah, but you could make something up. Mm -hmm. I um. Well, it's funny you say that. Um, This is given to me by the wonderful Catherine O'Hara. Because when she finally won for Schitt's Creek, she called me and she said, this is your Emmy, honestly. Because <laughs> whenever I have a line reading that I need help with or, or a motivation, she would call and I would help. So basically, I created and executed the role of Moira Rose through Catherine O'Hara. So um, That would have been my guess. <laughs> it's, it's, it's an Emmy Award back there, isn't that? fun <laughs> i've yeah. held ben schwartz's emmy that he won for writing for the oscars oh uh, when i held ben schwartz's emmy it was <laughs> it was his euphemism that he had for, his little gold man yeah yeah it was and it was it was just as pointy if yes. i'm being honest it was, heavy too yeah oh god heavier than you think and yes oh difficult to light if i'm being honest the gold power ranger oh <laughs> Well, we are off to a classy professional start here. <laughs> and it's quite fitting, really, that this is this is very unlike how we start the show typically, Ken, because we don't have such a prestigious guest. And um, stop it. I'm here every week. 
I, I meant I meant Ken, honey. Well, oh. And uh, but it's fitting because we are here to talk about a weird, weird ass episode of Facts of Life. Wow. Yeah, this is sort of a precursor to the weirdness we will get in the next two seasons. <laughs> yeah. Ken has always said uh, frequently on his show about how when a show runs, what do you say, past what, five or six seasons? Sure, or? Like five seasons, because then they have like a turnover in the behind the scenes crew. And also mm -hmm. they're like, well, we did everything. And I think the people in the show are just bored. And a lot of them are stage actors. So they're like, can we just do weird plays? <laughs> yeah. Can we do musical numbers? Can we have yeah. more fantasy sequences? And can I play an old lady? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> can my friend in the wheelchair tap dance? And <laughs> yeah, I don't so know. Can they? Can hmm. Is yeah. it may they tap dance or can they? Tap? <laughs> <laughs> but this is. Uh, I'm so happy to finally have you here. I've been trying to get you here since you had said in our uh, earlier meetings, earlier shows, how much you love over our heads. You have said, Ken is, I believe you said it is the aesthetic of your life. Yeah, I mean, look at the room I'm in right now. I mean, your listeners can't, but this is essentially I built an office that's like my attempt to live in over our heads. <laughs> <laughs> so Ken, it's my pleasure to introduce you to my co- Oh, one moment. In your break. This is, uh, speaking of over our heads, I have one of the Tangle sculptures that they have in the <gasps> first episode. Ah! Uh, <laughs> and this is an original Tangle sculpture, which again, people who are just listening couldn't uh, see that, but that took me years to find. Wow, I've had a, a little one. Like there was like a little Tangle tiny. Junior. Yep, yeah. It's called Tangle Tango. Tangle, like like untangle yeah the okay. ones that you, they sold later were called tangled junior and they were um manufactured by i forget the toy company but the the original ones were this new york artist and it was considered like a kinetic sculpture and then they they bought the rights to make these it was the slinky company that's who it is the company that made slinky oh okay and they then they marketed them towards children with autism as like a fidget spinner type thing <laughs> oh okay that that kind of makes sense i get it yeah, we have a, a pet peeve on the show. It's it's Matthew who brought this to my attention. A thing that he hates is sitcom lying. Uh, when people lie on a sitcom and do so very poorly to telegraph to the audience that they're lying, but the other characters in the scene with them would so clearly know. And we're thinking of the, that, it's... um. It's a planter. Yeah. Yeah, that's the ticket. <laughs> yeah. Ugh. And because uh, yeah, the but... audience is clearly too stupid to get that you're lying. So it's got to be this whole fucking production of, of uh, 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 yeah, I, I'm going, I'm going out with a friend. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> the uh. thing that never works is when writers use the word well because well. nobody can say like it takes a fairly skilled actor to use the word well uh naturally because they'll always be like well i well well it's a well like it never <laughs> like it especially makes it bad and i apologize i stepped all over matthew's interest so please uh no. please no 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 not at all here's the thing matthew sometimes does a little a, a little shtick that i wasn't sure if he was planning to do by making a late entrance so we're totally fine um what will happen is the the screen you won't see his face yet you'll just hear the audio and he'll say things like um oh and then after he was done i looked through the hole and it was dom de louise can you believe that ah uh, i see i see and only because it tasted like pizza sauce which was strange <laughs> <laughs> i would have expected vodka sauce given his uh history in Ooh. hollywood <laughs> I was just happy it wasn't Betty Schwartz's Emmy. <laughs> <laughs> but no, you stepped on nothing, Ken. It is my pleasure, Ken, to officially introduce you to my co-host, my sidekick, the Ed McMahon, to my Johnny Carson. This is Matthew Arder. Matthew Arder, TV guidance counselor, Ken Reed. Pleasure. I am starstruck, Ken Reed. <laughs> that never happens. I adore your podcast oh thank you and i it, it, mm, i don't know what to say without sounding like i'm smooching your butt so i will <laughs> i mean just, i'm not mad at that 
I love well, <laughs> like okay. <laughs> Much when like David will get guests on here that like um that like have never seen the facts of life and stuff. So I'll sit and listen and be like, why the fuck is that person on here? <laughs> and he knows this. This is not news. I will say I will text him notes when I when I listen. Um, but like when you get guests that like are like, what? What's family ties? I'm like, why are you on there? Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, the, it, well, that's usually if they're like 25. <laughs> <laughs> They're these like, kids yeah damn What's kids nbc yeah yeah so i love when you have to explain things that like um like just like when you're like no there were only three networks and the person's like what <laughs> what's a network because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, i spend my days watching pluto tv mainly that's I all pluto. i watch America's test kitchen i'm usually on pluto or uh the baywatch channel big big fan of that one I'm oh. watching the Price is Right, the Barker era. Oh, that's buzzer. what I watch. Yeah. Yeah. Well, buzzer. Price is Right has its own channel. The Does Price it? is Right, Barker era has its oh, own channel. Nice. And then the Buzzer channel has. Because Buzzer, I'm like, sale of the century, supermarket sweep. That's yeah. the, the gold oh. right there. The original uh, match game. You, I mean, just that's, oh my God, I could watch it for, and it's, it feels like you're watching TV again because. Yeah. It is a live feed that you're like, okay, I know other people are witnessing this in real time at the same time I am. That's what TV feels like. Yeah, and you get the menu screen as well, which I missed, like the, yeah. you know, like the channel lineup. And there's a Judge Judy channel now, oh. there, which is amazing. Uh, the other channel that the Rescue Nine One One channel. Uh, it's got it's got so it's, it has a Threes Company channel. Come on, there's a Love Boat channel. Yeah, which is appropriate yeah. for our discussion today actually it oh oh yes oh yeah we will we'll definitely talk about that and uh that's right maybe we should discuss the facts of i just want to shoot the breeze with you ken no, hey you know i got nothing to do <laughs> well ken you were last here uh your first appearance on the show was august of 2019 that was fear strikes back season three episode two and then we had you back april of 2020 for take my finals please Season four, episode 22, still my favorite episode of all time of the entire series. And then I got the pleasure of being on your show. Twice. I think we recorded. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Twice we recorded and then you had a technical snafu and you felt so bad. I really did. <laughs> and I was like, it's okay. I get to record with you another hour. I already have rehearsed the things I want to say. It's perfect. You're in rarefied air as one of the three episodes of my show that I've lost. Mm -hmm. The other being Keith Coogan and the third being Ricky Rackman and Zach Galligan together. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm, I'm in such good company. <clears throat> yeah. I don't know who they are. I'm sorry. Ricky Rackman uh, used to own the Viper Room in Los Angeles and then hosted Headbangers Ball and his and, and he i got a big scoop in that episode actually because he had never talked about this before but his stepmother was karen black <laughs> so oh. i got all this weird karen black stuff that i that that i regret keith coogan is jackie coogan's uh grandson he's in adventures and babysitting and, that's right uh, okay you know, everything that, i remember um, yeah and he had some great stories as well and I, I that was that was a rough one but of of 500 plus episodes three is not bad <laughs> yeah no that's that's a pretty good track record i haven't lost one yet <laughs> knock wood i'm so lucky um, I did fuck up another person's podcast by forgetting to wear earphones and we recorded separately. And then she tried to put them together and she's like, there's a terrible echo. And I was like, oh, shit. Yeah, so, it happens. I've, I've had that happen yeah. as well, but rescued best I could. Yeah, it's, People it's, understand. it's all good. It's all good. Well, we are so happy to have you back. And this is not the last time you're going to be here because I feel so bad for how much you love over our heads. I'm like, this would be a great weird episode for Ken to do. Not thinking there is no over our heads in this. We can't even talk about the store. Yeah, but I want to, I'm going to come back for seven little Indians, whether you like it or not. Oh, good. Good, good, good. Uh, that's a definite. Um, and I, it, it, maybe in, in probably the one uh, that introduces Pippa and likely the one where Pippa has a band and Stacy uh, Q is in uh, a cinnamon yeah. for the second time. <laughs> cinnamon. We're going to need a straight man for that one. I, her, 
her appeal goes right over my head. Yeah. So <laughs> <It's a> sex, <laughs> sexy lingerie <laughs> episode. So we just did that like literally last week. That was the, the, the sexy lingerie episode. And that's oh. the El DeBarge guest starring yes. spot. Yes. Yes. Cinnamon shows up the first episode, David, is this first episode for Cinnamon, I believe, is when they're auditioning for a Broadway show. And it is as if no one in the writer's room had ever seen an actor audition before yeah. or b- been around actors who've auditioned before. It was just a complete fantasy of what Broadway show auditions are. And like Cinnamon I've seen show- a chorus line. That's good enough. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what this is all like. Ugh. Uh, and Stacy Q is interesting in that she was in a weird electro punk band called SSQ that did some songs in the Return of the Living Dead soundtrack before she was sort of reinvented as this like pop Kylie Minogue type, uh, which is very strange. <laughs> it's I look forward to having you here. I'm I'm with Matthew because it's like this was the act that they went. We need to get that girl on our show. Damn, she needs to be on our show. Warner <laughs> Brothers, that's why. <laughs> oh, synergy. Um, this episode was written, oh, the episode we are about to discuss is season seven, episode eight. Come back to the truck stop, Natalie Green, Natalie Green. Though, already controversy, the DVD just lists this as truck stop. Why? And, uh, well, because, because the title is pretentious and over- Overwrought. It is referencing come back to the five and dine Jimmy Dean, Jimmy Dean for people mm-hmm. who don't know, which was a stage play, right? And then I think an 82 movie from Robert Altman. Yes. A stage play. It was Cher's Broadway debut, for God's sake. I'm weak mm-hmm. on my stage knowledge. <laughs> yes, I know. I your, last, your last episode with that couple, and they were like, which version of Chicago are you going to watch? Oh, the one with, with John C. Riley. And then somebody said, oh, I'm going to watch the one with Renee Zellweger. And I'm sitting my car going it's the same one (laughs) there's only one chicago (laughs) Uh. but yeah that was uh that was an altman movie it it had Cher in it it had sandy dennis it had karen black and uh karen black played i believe what nowadays we would call a trans woman yes though the big reveal in it big reveal oops spoiler alert uh, and in a supporting role, I believe her first film, Kathy Bates. Yes. And the entire stage uh, cast was brought back for the film. And if you watch the film, it looks like a stage play that a filmmaker pointed a camera at. And it's terribly uncinematic, I believe. Uh, but it's sort of intentional. Like it's like, cause he had just done Popeye, I think. And he was all like, <laughs> I'm going to do a really simple sort of stage play type. It, and also that was in the air. Cause when did um one from the heart come out? The, the Francis Ford Coppola movie, I think it was a similar year was kind of a similar thing. Uh, there was like where directors were like, I want to direct stage shows, but I'm a film director. So what can I do? <laughs> yeah. But things like the flashbacks were over, it takes place in a soda fountain, basically. And there's, of course, the requisite mirror on the back wall facing the bar. And that mirror turns out to be two-way glass. So theatrically, you can light behind it and suddenly you have people you can see in shadows and flashbacks and things. And that's awesome on stage. Doing it on film is like the two-way glass. In a yeah. movie, that's that's your big technical. Ooh, step aside, Lucas. Get out of here. <laughs> get out of here, Zemeckis and Spielberg. You're you're gonna get a run for your money here. We got two way fucking glass. It's like somebody tried to do a stage version of The Big Chill, and the only play that ever seen was Our Town. Oh my god. <laughs> so this episode now, I, I think literally because they were like. Oh, why is this title 20 times longer than every other title? So the DVD, which I have been taking as the Bible, like the order, the, the broadcast order and all that. Well, this just says truck stop. But uh, as far as the versions that I have downloaded and the IMDB listing and the Wikipedia listing, all of those call it come back to the truck stop, Natalie Green, Natalie Green. So that's what we are going to say this episode is called. If I and I will do this later, but if I had uh, more time to prepare for this, 
um, which is not a criticism, I would do my best to track down a shooting script for you uh, so that I could at least get uh, a photo of the cover, which would have the, the shooting title. Wow. Okay. That's great. And I hope start rounding them up for those others. Or do you already yeah. have them? I got some contacts that could, that could. Oh, help I cannot wait. I cannot <laughs> wait. Uh, speaking of contacts, we do have a little surprise coming up in a little bit, a little bit later as we discuss here. Um, that's, that's a little cliffhanger for you wow. and for my tens of listeners. Uh, the episode was written by Michael Maurer, M-A-U-R-E-R. This is the first of six episodes that he will work on between now and season eight. And he is the writer of season eight, episode one. That's the first part of the two-part episode where Mrs. Garrett departs the series. So he has kind of one of the episodes he's written is a kind of important one. Uh, and he's still out there today, still writing most of his credits. It looks like 90 to 95% of his credits are cartoons starting in the late seventies and a lot of series, not many one-offs. There's a lot of clumps of episodes of animated series. So. Which makes a lot of sense with this oh, episode. <laughs> explains a lot, doesn't it? And it was directed by John Boab. John is the in-house director these days. He directs the most of the Facts of Life and pretty much all of them this season. And by and this time, directing is a strong word. For, <laughs> yeah, for what's happening. Are the I'll cameras on? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be yep. honest with you. I wrote down zero things like for notes for this because I, I love this episode. Don't get me wrong. I love it. I love it. I love it. But trying to keep notes and stuff, I was like, this. it's just so non sequitur. I, uh, so I was just like, I'll just give up. The only note I have is really Pearl Bailey. Okay. Yeah. That's the only <laughs> thing I wrote down. <laughs> Although well, Hee Haw was huge at the time. <laughs> what does Pearl Bailey have to do with Hee Haw? No, that's mini Pearl, Ken. Mini Pearl. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> How did I can um, see why you would get them confused? But... Mm -hmm. oh, straight guys, Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh. Um. So yeah, I'm I'm with you, Matthew. I I have my typical detailed, meticulous synopsis here, but I'm thinking I'm going to try to do the thing where I attempt to abandon it to give us a little more freeform ability to speak. But we cannot even begin that process until Ken. I put my guest on the spot and ask you to provide a one to two sentence synopsis of the entire episode, something like, oh, a listing you might find in a TV guide. Uh, Natalie fantasizes about the comings and goings of an isolated truck stop. Thank you. Fucking thank you. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, so... The beginning of the episode, we start on a neon sign. We read from the neon sign that we are at Bernie's Truck Stop Cafe. And uh, it pans out and we are in a completely foreign place and we are gonna be here the entire episode. It's like a slightly lower class Mel's Diner, wouldn't you say? It reminds me a little bit of the diner from the uh, Twilight Zone episode with the real Martian, please stand up. If you recall that episode, uh, I don't. I've I've only started watching. Matthew, why are you laughing so hard? <laughs> yes, I, what you, mean. you know what I mean. Yeah, and like it, like to the point where I was like, "Is this the same set?" Oh my god! Well, now I have to watch that. I I haven't seen it. I've I've only started watching Twilight Zone fairly recently. It's mm. only and and there's a lot of them. It's Rim like... for a treat. Would the real Martian please stand up? Is one of the comedy episodes. And it's it's very good. It's 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 sort of the quintessential bottle episode of the Twilight Zone. Oh, good. Well, now I have to watch that. Uh, there is an old jukebox by the door, and what is it playing? Do you remember? Stand by your yes. man. Yes. For some reason. Yeah, because like, this is supposed to be in upstate New York. <laughs> it's supposed to be Pennsylvania. Okay, so but in that area, like yeah. over right over the border there, and yeah. It, it, but it is full on, like could be in the middle of Arkansas here. It, yeah. it well, it is weird, and let's we can we can stop right here because the Natalie comes in 
Natalie has uh, hit a, a snag in her travels. We know Natalie was going to be traveling in lieu of attending college. And so this is now, oh, okay, Natalie is our way in. She's the fish out of water. And this truck stop with all of these interesting characters, Natalie is trying to write. She's trying to experience things. And she thinks to herself, okay, this would be a great place to find inspiration. And Natalie attempts to write a story and a, a very common theatrical device that you find is as you're writing the story, the characters appear, the characters start talking back, they want to take over or leave. It's, it's a structure that gives a lot of leeway for fun and absurdity. And yeah, so that's really the bigger picture of the episode. It's but, used, that, that conceit, uh, in, in my opinion, is best used in the film Delirious with John Candy. Have you ever seen that? No. John <laughs> Candy is a soap opera writer who is hit on the head and wakes up in the soap opera he writes for, but everything he writes happens. So he's sort of controlling this world. And it's a totally underrated movie. There's some really weird dark humor in that that uh, is just great. Emma Sams is really good in it. Uh, it's, it's a good movie. And it, it, it's this pretty much this sort of exact thing. Huh. Well, another thing I have to watch now. Thanks, Ken, for the homework. God. and like, a, a fine film based on a prince title oh <laughs> yeah already when i listen to your show i walk away going well there's three more things i have to watch add that <laughs> to the so pile so and, no. and you How do you, you follow up uh you find these things <laughs> <laughs> raymond burr is in that movie for god's sake oh he is that's right and um <laughs> what's his name from uh who's in the good fight he's the murderer and he's also in happiness I'm dylan baker dylan baker I'm remembering Muriel, Hem Muriel Hemingway. Oh, yes, that's right. M Muriel. Mur M Muriel. Oh. oh, that's right. The yes. child that Woody Allen wants to fuck in the movie Manhattan. Ah, Just the yes. one. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was yeah. what was revolutionary about it. It was just one. I'm also uh, shocked that Natalie appears to be doing this sort of Kerouac uh, journey on a bicycle uh we oh yeah we're gonna talk about that <laughs> let's let's first i was trying to speed up because you already brought up a great point that i want to emphasize the waitress that she talks to not the sharpest knife in the drawer and she's sort of having this slightly new york kind of a talk well last time we had a rainstorm and the power went out and natalie's like oh that must have been exciting what intrigue happened tell me tell me all the meat in the freezer went bad and that Natalie's like, cool. oh, OK, but that's giving us a kind of a New York thing. So then Natalie uh, says, oh, maybe maybe the truck drivers have got interesting stories. And these two truck drivers sit down. The first one says, uh, so uh, what are you hauling? And he pine says, board. pine board. How about you? Fertilizer. Oh, that's fertilizer. Right. That's right. Now, granted, they are truck drivers. They could be hauling from the south to the north. But I'm like, OK, we have quite a little dialect cocktail being presented to us, ladies and gentlemen. It's almost as bad as the movie version of Steel Magnolias as far as <laughs> as far as um, accents go and nobody being in charge and saying, y'all grew up in the same small town. Yeah. So, you know, you should all have sort of the same accent. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, enough about or my personal betrayals. The uh, the Crystal Bernard mystery of really everything she's in, but specifically wings. Oh, you grew up on Nantucket and you have an accent <laughs> like you grew up in rural Tennessee. And that's never mentioned or explained, uh, much like every movie Schwarzenegger and Van Damme is in. OK, sure. Let's let's just suspend that disbelief. Why don't we? Uh, so there is this sense of. So wait a minute. Where where are we? And we learn that. Natalie has uh, broken down outside. It's outside of Philly. Like she was, she was in Philly that morning. So we're outside of Philly. So it's like, I always think of Tina Fey and her magnificent Philly accent when she puts it on, when she's, you Water. know, we've, we, we've traveled across many waters, across the Skokie river. And uh, anyway, it's not an accent I'm very good at doing. So I will do no more. Uh, so we've got this thing, but yeah, let's let us backtrack. When Natalie walks in, she has got a bicycle in two pieces, yes. the front wheel dented, 
And so she gets on the phone, tries to call home, and she gets the answering machine. And she says, on the answering machine, um, uh, all right, well, here's the short version. Natalie Green on the road is a bust. That's your Kerouac uh, reference there. Uh, I'm coming home. That's all. About your bike, I've had it modified. Bye. So Blair has a bike. You know, we, Blair on her bike rides all the time. You know that Blair Warner biker chick? We learned two pieces of interesting information about Blair from this exchange. Uh, one, she owns a bike, which maybe she's just rich. She has a bike. She doesn't use it. Maybe. Uh, but two, presumably, this is pre-cell phone. So the girl's house has one answering machine, which we've never seen. And Blair is the one that does the outgoing message. I would not have suspected that to be the case. Uh, true. And actually, we have heard it before, Kent. We have called home and gotten the answering. I'm trying to remember what, what was the episode. You remember, Matthew? Where And the, machi the, the machine, it, it just shows a close-up of the machine on the ah. desk. And you hear, hello, we're not here. And then Tootie says, so leave us a message. And Natalie's like, and we'll call you. Like, they took turns they to took make turns. it. That, that's what I would expect. But apparently, since that time, Blair has decided she's going to take over and be the outgoing message. Because Natalie has an instant where she's like, Blair, it's great to hear your recorded voice. Like, because it's she thinks it's her and then it's yeah. Message. Maybe she had the music on in the background and the uh, the outgoing message is, hello, wait, wait, wait a minute. Let me turn the music down Yeah, and turn I the music down and do that. Oh, those when fuckers. Be like, It'd be like, hi. Nope, I'm not here. And no, like, you son of a bitch. Damn you. Damn you to hell. <laughs> so Natalie on the road on a bicycle. She does ask when the next bus is back to Peekskill to go home. She's going to take the bus home. But are we to assume that she has been biking her way down the coast that she is a peak skill. And she has a backpack that literally has a notebook and a pen in it. Like she's a writer <laughs> <laughs> and writers don't bathe. Writers don't need toiletry. It's like, I don't know. I mean, if she had had kind of a bigger ass, like camping backpack, like, you know, I'm just traveling with my stuff. M maybe, maybe it might be believable, but I was just like, whoa, 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 what? This is no. the the beginning, uh, and this may be a controversial opinion, but this is the beginnings of when there's sort of a tug of war behind the scenes at Facts of Life over who is the main character of this show. Oh. And I think there's a contingent of writers that absolutely believes it's Natalie and is really pushing for her to be the center of the show. And there's another set of writers that are all about Blair. Mm -hmm. As we move into these final three seasons, most of the storylines start to revolve around them or the big, um, especially the sort of spin-off storylines <laughs> yeah. that could potentially be. Yeah, even Joe at the youth center with Paul Provenza. Paul Provenza ends up being Blair's fellow for yes. stuff. Joe it's is like just a fulcrum to get Provenza and Blair together. <laughs> And thank you for being the first person to use the word fulcrum oh, on welcome. my show. It's one of my favorites. I'm honored. Uh, so Natalie, after making this phone call, leaves her bike in the middle of the floor, in front of a door. She just leaves it there and then sits at the counter. And then we get uh, a device not frequently used, but it's only been used a couple of times. It's, it's not something we hear a lot of, where we hear the inner thoughts of a character while they are in a scene and this is her what she is writing so she's saying day nine of my journey to nowhere so on the last so for nine days she's been biking from Peekskill to philly i don't know if that tracks i meant to look that up and i forgot i suppose well, you could. from upstate new york yeah because Peekskill is supposed to be like around albany is that right no Syracuse? no it's only an hour outside of new york city oh, it's so not as far north. okay so then philly from new york is like a two and a half hour drive so yeah, nine days, that would work about right. Yeah, that's and that's long. I mean, yeah. Okay. Um, she must have been going real slow. I'm just happy she didn't show up on a skateboard because for some reason she's dressed like Marty McFly from Back to the Future. <laughs> Very much. And also, like, do you remember the episode of Roseanne where she dresses up as a man and goes to the to the uh club to the bar? Yeah. Natalie, aside from the beard, is dressed 
identical to her in that. Show. Yeah, very lumberjill, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Wow, it's true. Now there's another TV trope. How many TV shows have done the episode where uh, women go to the bar in drag, like Laverne and Shirley, because they had to get yeah. their name off the men's room wall? And uh, there's okay, that's another. We'll, we'll look that up on TV tropes. We we got to stick to this here. Uh, so as Natalie writes, this is where she lays down the whole conceit of uh, I'm I'm experiencing life and I'm finding things to write about. But she's blocked a little bit. She's like, come on, Green, you can come up with things. Maybe the waitress, maybe the trucker. And uh, because it's 8 p.m. and the bus to Peekskill is at midnight, she's basically trapped there for four hours. So the inspiration hits when one of the truckers is an asshole to the waitress about how shitty the coffee is. And Natalie just goes, uh, and, and the springboard of this is Natalie saying, okay, they say, write what you know, write what you know. And then that incident happens. And then she thinks, <laughs> yeah, wow. Joe would never put up with that. I'd like to see him try that with Joe. Which is a weird thing. That's sort of like a uh, dealing with a step parent saying, you're not my real father. Like, like, you're not my real character. Like, yeah, you know, you're not good enough. You can't do things in my world. I need Joe. Yeah. It's like she couldn't just imagine this waitress kicking this dude's ass. It's like, hmm. You know, it's weird, too. This seems to be a character inconsistency, which you two would know much better than I would here. But traditionally, Natalie was always presented as a journalist, like that kind of writer. Like she wanted to sort of write about you know, real things and humanity and sort of, uh, you know, like she almost is a gonzo journalist at times later, like she's going undercover or she's going to write a story about this restaurant or, you know, whatever it is. So it's odd that she, she's in a, a, a sort of purely Americana world in a creative it's, place. Yes. And yeah. instead of sort of getting involved or learning about it, she just creates some completely fantastical world that's already the people she knows <laughs> yeah as opposed to it being a more almost an exploration of working people and meeting folks yeah this could have had a little more of a uh expository quality to it okay. that's what i was thinking like let me talk to these people they probably have interesting lives but no yeah. Yeah, well, we know that she used to write, uh, Matthew, help me with this. We know she was writing a play slash monologue for Tootie to use at a competition. Um, and there was, I'm, I feel like there's two, and I can't think of the second one, but my brain is telling me there are two instances where she, oh, oh and she was lyric writing. When we met Mrs. Garrett's uh, Fliberty Gibbet son, when we met... Um, not Raymond, uh, Alex, I think is the younger son, the one that was kind of the, hey, I'm touring with a with a band. Yeah, yeah, that's it. I'm a guitar player and I, I well, make music. Uh... I make music with famous people. Yeah. So we had Natalie as a lyric writer in that. I feel like you are right. I'm agreeing with you. I feel like there that, were school newspaper articles and that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. We had journalists, but I think honest and truly for how fuzzy some of the other characters are, the fact that they can't decide what kind of writing Natalie does, but that it all falls under the umbrella of she's a writer. I'm okay with it. Fair enough. For me, that, that gets my seal of approval because Blair, you know, Blair's the artist. Oh, but she's also a vaudevillian performer with cousin Jerry, but you know, Blair award also is ventriloquist an award winning <laughs> ventriloquist. Yes. And then it's like, oh, but you know, all of the positions I hold at my dad's corporation. It's like, when, when do you have time to be right. a junior executive? International when National business woman. <laughs> yeah. And then you go to Paris with the girls and you're like, oh, I love it. Every time I come here, it's like, bitch, and where I'm going do you to find... law school? <laughs> yeah. And then she ends up going to law school when the, um, the, the year 2000 episode, that flash forward nightmare yep. dream she has, that episode literally existed so that we reestablished that Blair wants to reconnect with her artistic self. Like they were really insistent that that was the course they were plotting. And then they abandoned it again. So Natalie, as a writer, I don't give a fuck what kind of a writer she is. <laughs> I am happy. 
but you They're are right. words, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a pen and a paper, ain't it? Well, and she's also doing the, the sitcom trope. I mean, it's obvious she's not writing anything. Mm. It's just, mm. might as well just be like drawing on that paper. It, it, it drives me crazy that she's not even attempting to look like she's writing. I call mm -hmm. it Mr. Belvedere style journaling. Oh my God. Beautiful. Yeah. Like, um, and when you see people typing and you know, they're not tight, like I'm thinking of Dick Van Patten on eight is enough when he'd be sitting at the typewriter and, um, even Angela Lansbury sometimes on murder. How she wrote. dare you? How dare you imply? <laughs> I'm done. We're going to start the, insulting Angela Lansbury. I'm out. <laughs> Pre nineties version of hacking. When people are wow. actors in a show, it's just yeah. That's how they used to write. Yeah, you have to just as long as you're constantly tapping keys, something's happening. Yeah, like in the movie, um, is it Showgirls or is it Glitter? It's one of the two where you yes. know there's it, it's both of them where it's like, can I have your social security number? And they're like, um, uh, it's two. Okay. Yeah. And you, it's like it's one number. What the fuck? There's a famous story about uh, Russ Meyer that when he was had uh, Roger Ebert writing Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, he Russ Meyer believed if he didn't hear typing, writing wasn't going on. Oh, my God. So <laughs> Roger was down the hall and every so often he'd have Russ Meyer like peek through the door and be like, why aren't you working? <laughs> so Roger would just have to like constantly be making typewriter noises or he was like, I'm paying you to work. <laughs> wow. Uh, so as this episode progresses, uh, Joe comes in and now Joe is dressed as this waitress, completely not Joe Polnicek. She's got teased up hair. She has got a bright red lip. We never see Joe with lipstick. God knows. Uh, she's wearing the same Mel's Diner uh, pink outfit. She's got a big baggy sweater over it. But um, suddenly Natalie is deciding she wants to maybe write this story about this tough, weather-worn, uh, obviously from the Bronx type of a, uh, waitress character and then uh we start getting into this thing where natalie starts adding characters and trying to find the plot and the drama and the suspense and throughout the rest of the episode all of the dialogue all of the physicality everything is heightened melodramatic they're going for basically soap opera type of stuff it's more looney tunes yeah like it's it's i think it, it's almost like they were too scared to go full hell's a poppin yeah yeah so it's just like a real looney tunes kind of like cartoonish thing yeah we're much closer to an anvil falling out of the out of the sky than yes. we are anything else yes, yeah absolutely <laughs> And, and there are inconsistencies with that. You can tell they wanted to go screwy, screwy, and they, they just couldn't find it. The, the two moments that stick out for me is later in the episode, Natalie kind of says, okay, wait a minute, this would be a perfect time. And Natalie picks up a cigarette. She walks over to the counter and an arm just pops up with a lighter. She lights the cigarette. <clears throat> and then blows out the lighter and then doesn't smoke the cigarette, but just this arm comes out of nowhere. Um, and then there's a point very late in the episode where Joe, as this waitress, makes a joke. And in and, and the moment is Joe says something to one of the characters like, you can't appreciate a good omelet until you've hatched one yourself. And then she looks at the camera, which nobody has done in this episode yet, and says, I got a lot of good lines like that. Yes. And yeah, I'm like, does she? Does Clooney, I think Clooney looks at the camera. Clooney's a gem in this episode, by the oh, way. Oh my God, yes. Because he is, I mean, he's, he's great on the show in general, but one of his great talents, uh, almost to a fault, is the ability to be detached from what he's in <laughs> yes. so he comes in and does intentional bad acting yes and it is just the highlight of this episode i i could not agree more it's yeah it takes a good i say it takes a good actor 
to act like a bad actor. You, you have to know the rules before you break them. It takes a great singer to sing badly. A lot of people think, oh, well, we'll just hire a bad singer. It's like, no, no, no. You hire Madeline Kahn to be Lily Von Stupp in Blazing Saddles. And yeah. that is the genius you get. That needs to be controlled. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's one of those things where, uh, well, we are just going to take off here. We're going to take the bus. And Natalie says, you can't leave this, the, you know, my story. And they're like, well, why not? She says, the, the bus can't go anywhere because it's raining and the bridge is flooded out. And they're like, what are you talking about? Suddenly rain starts pouring outside and Clooney walks in as the bus driver. And he literally says, any of you here to go on my bus? Sorry, can't do it. Bridge is flooded over. Like, yes. But, oh my God. So fan fucking tastic. It's perfect. Yeah. yeah. And uh, agreed. He is my favorite thing in this whole episode. Uh, but yeah, the inconsistencies of those other things, like the, the breaking the fourth wall, why didn't they break the fourth wall sooner? And, and that's the joke that the, the um, that's not even a good joke. And you you don't have you haven't been cracking wise the entire time to have bought yourself that that was very, very strange. This all has the air to me of a Bruce Valanche written 70s variety show sketch oh like yes. it feels very much like that like donnie and marie would be the waiter and one of the truck drivers you know and they'd have you know william conrad come in as you know the <laughs> the part 2d played and uh you know i don't know who would be the blair part maybe um uh that woman from laughing <laughs> um, <laughs> ruth buzzy or ruth buzzy yeah you yeah. know it just feel like it's got that kind kind of vibe to it yeah and the big moment that we <clears throat> while you're talking about a variety show we have to talk about it it's like it would be something as crazy as natalie looking at her page and saying okay i've got these crazy characters you're all wanting to do this another thing Pfft, what's gonna happen now is charo gonna come running in and, and charo comes in yeah the charo is in this episode Holy shit, she is fan fucking tastic. Oh, she's amazing, but it again makes it feel like that sort of Paul Lind show 1970s variety show sketch episode. Yeah. And while Charo is there, she comes running in and doing her coochie, 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 and she sings Guanta le gusta and starts a conga line and she's just going crazy and uh, and Natalie is screaming and yelling at people going no no stop this this is not my story and so Natalie's angry at this and also having a psychotic break a like, little bit Natalie is now arguing <laughs> with herself in her own head yeah oh my goodness can we talk a bit about Charo like do a little bit of a sidebar about this woman in her career so one thing I will mention to, to segue into that is Charo essentially is playing a living intrusive thought in this mm -hmm. episode, uh, which Charo is a force of nature. But yeah, she she was a classical guitarist who played with Xavier Cugat in his big band for years and is amazingly talented at that. Look for you. There are YouTube videos as recently as 2013. I found one. I'll post a link to it of her playing the classic flamenco Spanish style guitar. And it is insane. If you don't follow her in social media, you must. Her Instagram is fantastic. I think, Matthew, you told me to do it, didn't oh, yeah. you? Oh, yeah. And uh, I mean, the thing that I love about Charo is, is she... 80 or is she 25 like, <laughs> I, because that woman has looked that this was filmed what almost 40 years ago mm -hmm. she looks exactly the same yeah mm -hmm. and so good job her because but yeah she's one of those people that people think of as a joke but you're like jane mansfield like she was anything but a joke she is one of the most talented human beings and i saw her in person one time oh my god her feet are disgusting <laughs> who um, charo yeah because she was sitting on a she has always wears those open-toed shoes so under three pairs of pantyhose and tights and everything and you could just see her toes were like because she's 110 and yeah. she's been dancing and wearing those heels, but, heels yeah. but her toes were like, she could swoop down over a lake and pick up lunch. Oh, oh God. Yeah. <laughs> well, she also, she, this same year, 85, she was in Pee Wee's uh, Christmas special. 
Yep. Uh, and she was kind of, she had become a little bit in vogue again, but she always was knowing about it. Like she always was very, uh, and still is if you follow her on social media, like she's very wink and a nod about her reputation and her career, which is pretty amazing. Uh, my favorite thing is she, the only time I've ever seen her get really serious was when she was on VH1 Surreal Life. Oh. And Jordan Knight was one of the people, Dave Coulier, uh, Vern Troyer, I think, um, what's her name that was married to Sylvester Stallone and then had a relationship with Flavor Flav? Brigitte Nielsen. Brigitte Nielsen uh, and, and someone else. But they, they had to do it. They had to record a song. And uh, Dave Coulier was like, well, I could do mouth trumpet. And he's doing his like, num, num, num. and she gets so mad and she just keeps going, the trumpet of a human being? <laughs> the trumpet of a human being? Like, she's so mad that this is in this song. And I'm like, yes, she's a serious musician. That's offensive to her. Well, and the well thing Dave is- Coulier is offensive to a lot of people. So, <laughs> I mean, if we're being honest, if you have to go for Coulier, you've already lost the argument. <laughs> but that's the thing about her is the the phenomenon, the enigma for me is just it's this thing of she speaks English and other languages, supposedly. And so much of what her shtick was, was her speaking broken English and saying things that maybe sound a little dirty and all that. But she and she's still on her Instagram. It's all amigos today. I'm going to try to take on the trampoline because it's important to exercise. Like she still talks that way. And there was like I remember her. I think it was on Johnny Carson where she says, oh, I like to go to the da, 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 da. and Johnny says the, the something or other like to make sure you understand. She goes, yes, don't you speak English? And she is so you get it's it's like she, i think she's in on the joke she's of course she's she's like a mad genius because i think like you think when her instagram when they turn off and say okay it was that good she's like yeah did that go okay cool all right i'm gonna go over and garden for a little bit now and um yeah let me know how many likes i get on that cool thanks Potentially, i mean the other thing is if you've heard her speak spanish i forget she's from somewhere in south america uh, no she's from name. spain she's spanish is she she's from spain spain she's spain spanish um, yeah because her Spanish accent is essentially the Spanish version of Raquel Welch's accent, like that odd, uh, almost like mid Atlantic. Like that's she's she speaks like that Spanish. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you're taught English in Spain, you're taught British English, so right. it would have an an English. And the th- 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 yeah. Th- and the el cefeo. Th- that's the other thing where a lot of the c sounds come out like a th. Um, but funny you brought up how old is she, Matthew? Because her birth date was in dispute for many, many years. (laughs) I was looking her up, and this is on Wikipedia. First of all, she was born Maria del Rosario Mercedes Pilar Martinez Molina Baeza. Weren't we all? Uh, And originally, there was a dispute whether she was born in 1941 or 1951. And I actually think it was much closer to 1931. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I would say, uh, yeah, absolutely. But the deal is, and then there was apparently also a possibility of it being 1945, because there was some sort of an appearance that might have been Ed Sullivan or something in 1966, where they introduced her as a 21 year old. And it's like, okay, wait, huh? But she was playing with Cougat in the 50s. (laughs) Well, no. Well, allegedly, she says that the documents in Spain and the migration documents and all that somehow got it wrong and she convinced a judge that she was born in 1951 so that is <laughs> legally that's what's on the books that's impressive but if you look on an appearance on ed sullivan in 1965 it's like if you were born in 1951 you were 14 she is not 14 in this appearance i'll post no. the video she looks more 24 and maybe even older. I'm, I'm with Matthew here. And yet look at the Carol Burnett show in 1973. In 1973, according to her birth date, 1951, she'd have been 22. And it's like, okay, I could kind of buy that. That's the nah. one where Carol, Carol plays her mother with the saggy boobs. It's, it's fucking hilarious. Oh my God. I'll put that. I got like links to that video too. Cause it's, love boat was what? 75 love boat started. Maybe no, like 70, 76 to 83 ish. And she's like in her fifties. on love boat. Yeah. 
Well, here, <laughs> as of 1985, if you take that she was born in 1951, that yeah. means that she it's is 35, uh, 34, 35. Yeah. Um, I'm, uh, I'm not so sure about it. It's convenient no. that the date she convinced the judge was her actual birth date was the later of all the disputed dates. That's pretty convenient. Coincidence, but, I'm sure. Yeah, because that would make her 70 today. And it's like she's definitely not 70. I, I don't think so either. <laughs> I'm thinking she's closer to 80. And I'm thinking more than that. <laughs> but she looks amazing. She's like she posts, you you know, on her Instagram. She she'll be on the trampoline and she'll be exercising. And she's had a little work done. A l- little bit. <laughs> I, th- I think she's got a beard after yeah. all the facelifts, but but she is active. Oh, God. Yeah. And she still looks amazing. Amazing. So, um, uh, oh, we were talking about, you know, the artistry. People think of her as a joke because of the persona and all that. And she had that artistry. Liberace, same thing. People forget what a fucking amazing piano player he was. Oh, yeah. Yeah. When you look at it, it's like, oh, this is how he got famous. Jesus. Or even to a lesser degree, like someone like Glenn Campbell. Uh, you know, just because he hosted a variety show, I'm like, that guy was a session guitarist for in the Wrecking Crew for like 20 years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like that guy's a murderer on the yeah. guitar. Yeah. So for one of the weirdest of the episodes thus far, uh, I'm sorry. We have George Clooney and we have Charo. That is all I need to make me happy in a half hour of television. Yeah. I mean, you could have not said the phrase in a half hour of television and I would have agreed with that. (laughs) That's all you need out of life. So now is the time for me to reveal my little surprise. Uh, I've been waiting for this moment to happen. Not not that little little surprise. No, sorry. Damn it, David. (laughs) (laughs) But um, I forget, Ken, if I told you that Matthew and I have made friends with the woman who was the costumer for the last three seasons. Yes, you did. Yes. Diana Eden. I did an entire show that was just us interviewing her. Well, I haven't done this yet. I haven't kind of played this card where silently I've been like, I want to know some things. I want to know stuff. And uh, so in this case, uh, I did write to her and I did say, okay, we just watched the episode with Charo. El DeBarge was on last week. I'm like, do you have any stories, any memories? And the other question I have is, uh, did they bring their own costumes or did you do that? Is that one of yours? And, uh, her information, I mean, she she is 81 years old, and this was 35 years ago. So she does say, I don't have specific memories. Maybe if I watched the episode, I'd see it. But uh, in response to the question about um, whether celebrities bring their own wardrobe, she says, usually when celebrities do a guest starring role on a show, they bring their own wardrobe, though they consult with the designer to see what type of wardrobe fits the scene. And she says, for Charo, for instance, I can't imagine anyone being able to provide her with Charo outfits better than her, especially in the one week format. That's right, because they're always in a time crunch. Right. So, yeah. And then that she also stuff isn't exactly off the rack. Like, no. She can't run she... to, to the TJ Maxx and be like, you know what? This will look great on Charo. Maybe now. Yeah, <laughs> with, um, with her eight-inch waist and yeah, her, and yeah, her yeah. Girl always tits. dresses like Chara. Yeah. <laughs> no, nothing was said about El DeBarge, unfortunately, because I think El DeBarge looks like a, a Wayans brother character. Oh yeah, El DeBarge. First of all, El DeBarge looks like a woman dressed as a man. Like that mustache does not look. Yeah, like he made that. It's Felicia Rashad yeah. as a drag king, I think. Well, if you recall, El DeBarge came from the group DeBarge, which was him and his siblings. And there is a sister in that group. And it looks like a before and after. <laughs> well, like the Michael and Janet and Latoya. It's like, have yes. we seen them in the same room together ever? Yeah. El DeBarge was also in a Punky Brewster. And I want to say a give me a break like the same year. Well, it was, a, I think oh, it was a solo. How dare you bring up, how dare you, Ken Reed, bring up <laughs> Mel Carter in my presence. You don't like oh. Mel? You, I have loved hearing, this is why you have to have Carol Lee on your show, my drag persona, because um, <laughs> she has done them all. And Nell Carter, that bitch, <laughs> 
<laughs> she, it, oh my God. I, she uh, seems like a lunatic. Um, yes. <laughs> she definitely got a case of the bat shit. Yeah. And um, she was just one of the most unpleasant people I've ever met in my life. That and does I met not her, surprise me. Um, as a fan, and I met her because when she's at Disney World, when celebrities are at Disney, they get a tour guide with them. She opened the door for her tour guide and um, slammed it and then called the VIP tour guide office and was bitching and said, I asked for a beautiful woman tour guide. <laughs> So she was a huge carpet muncher, by the way. So you would say <laughs> that she was misbehaving. Uh, totally. Oh, totally. <laughs> Bam. That's a Broadway joke, Ken. I'm impressed. Yes. Getting better. Nice. Uh, yeah. I mean, but it was the year of Elder Barge. He also did Who's Johnny in Short Circuit the same year. Oh, geez. That was that was a big year for him. Yeah, you could see it was such a, oh, this is the next Michael. This is just like the Jackson 5 and what Michael did. This is the next thing. This is, we're going to do it too. It was a great year for him. Sadly, there were no other great years. Yes, for him, <laughs> the fir first in a series of one great years. <laughs> Yeah. Bless his heart. Yeah. So I thank Diana Eden for writing back to me. And I did approach her very nice. genteely saying, please don't think I'm going to inundate you or whatever. And her response just like, nah, ask me. I don't care. You're not going to, you don't bother me. You're fine. So um, next time I might send her a, a link to the show and say, hey, would you look at this again and tell me if there's any stories? Um, I might can always text her, David. We, we text. So... Yeah, I, I have her email address, Ken. Matthew somehow finagled her phone number and texts with her. It's the way to do it. That's what I do with my guests. I had her on my show five minutes in. I, I had her. I interviewed her for my my show that I was doing. My, my drag character was doing a show called Five Minutes In, where I spent five minutes in a celebrity, Ken Reed. And I think <laughs> I would love to, I would love to spend five minutes in you, if I'm being honest. But um, I mean, hey, shoot me an email, talk to my people. She sent me, um, I always feel If like you give him creeper. your phone number, Ken, you fucking <laughs> give it to me too. Nope. Don't have God a phone. damn it. <laughs> Don't you start texting with him too. <laughs> I just want to be loved. All I have is a phone with an answering machine and Blair does the outgoing. <laughs> so Diana Eden will be consulted in future episodes. Excellent. She has already signed off that uh, I am okay to do that with her. So only when there's really out there costumes like the seven little Indians and, and uh, the, uh, the Blair birthday one with the T the um, Alice in Wonderland party. And the one woman band there. There's yes. a lot that that's the first one that came to mind. Yeah. And the, the one, the one with Fabian and Bobby Rydell, the -la -la 62 pickup, 62 pickup, 62 yeah. pickup. Yes. Yeah. That one, you got to be here for that one too. Ken. Oh yeah. Yeah. So how about we talk about the music in this episode? There is a, a distinct artistic choice where whenever we are in the story, they choose to underscore everything pretty much. And there are some odd choices here. The first music that we hear is kind of uh, orchestral. It sounds like Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue. And I'm not sure if it is the actual Rhapsody in Blue or if it's just some industrial music on a CD that was made to sound like that. Yeah. It's not Rhapsody in Blue. <laughs> it, it sounds a lot like it, though, doesn't it? I mean, to me, it just sounded like one of those like farcical, like whodunit kind of like underscoring. Like it, like a. I think you've mentioned this movie before, Ken, and I wanted to make out with you because nobody's <laughs> ever, ever knows what movie this is. The Private Eyes with Don Knotts and and yeah. Tim Conway. Yeah. Nobody knows that movie, but. Um, but I feel like it was like that. Like there's just like this underlying, they, they for some reason, weirdly needed a score. And I don't know why. Yeah, they're needle drops. They're, 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 I think they were going for, it's almost Mickey Mousing, uh, speaking of Disney, which is mm -hmm. that like every single move is, you know, scored. But that is, 
that adds to that cartoonish thing. That's exactly how a cartoonist scored. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, it does. And like when 2D comes in dressed as we haven't even covered the fact that Blair is at the counter dressed as the mysterious woman in red. Yeah. And she's Some got a noir sort of uh, villainous. Yeah. She's got the gloves on and the big bling diamondy bracelet over the red satiny gloves and a hat with a feather in it, her hair is up. She's supposed to be the mysterious woman. When Tootie comes in as a, a, a pilot, as a female pilot, we get this dun, 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 this big superhero type of music. I remember when I was doing a, a local show at like a local cable company uh, in Bridgewater, Massachusetts, and they had a library of CDs that was just pre-composed, pre-recorded, fully orchestrated music in all different veins and types and styles that they had paid for. And by buying the CDs, you have also paid the rights to use it however you want. It, it, it's the predecessor to the iTunes library. Yeah, so absolutely. What, what we get now with um, and, and my listeners here every week in the extras and the uh, in the iTunes um, garage band uh, loops. <laughs> yes. I think it, Loops is what the kids are calling him now. So this does seem like that's more what they were using. I do not believe they had a composer and a fucking band in the no, studio. Absolutely not. No. It's Drop library in. music. Yeah, it's library needle drop music. Absolutely. Like they like the Warner library mm -hmm. of, of music. In fact, I, I this episode in general has the feel of what do we have laying around the studio? Like they did not build this diner set for this episode. Oh fuck no. I've seen this diner set in other shows and I'm 99% sure it was reused in Dolly's variety show in 86, 87, the next year, if you oh, recall that show, yeah, because she had a, a reoccurring sketch on that show. That was a dramatic sketch set in a diner where Dolly played the waitress in the diner and then the guests on the show would come in and it was never common. It was always dramatic. I don't know why, but I'm 99% sure that it is the exact same diner set. It is very detailed. The, the painting, like the, the brushwork of making sure the walls look weathered and all that it is, it is a very meticulously put together the, the counter where we're seeing behind the counter facing the audience, uh, all of the counter it's stocked. You can see the napkins and the, the jug of ketchup or whatever. It's you're right that this seems like there's no fucking way they would have gone to these lengths for just one single bottle Standing episode. Set, yeah. I believe this was used in a, in a family ties uh, when Alex uh, the, uh, the post prom episode, I feel like there was one and there's also a growing pains that I feel like has used this set uh, in the Luke Brower years like this, this, this has popped up. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I don't recall seeing it anywhere to me. It just looks like a lot like Mel's diner. It's a very, it, it feels like, um, it definitely has a sense of I've been here before <laughs> and maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's what they wanted. So to break up this Charo uh, cul-de-sac, this sidebar that happens in the story with Charo coming in and disrupting Natalie's uh, artistic beautifulness, Natalie pulls out a gun and then uh, Charo does leave and, and gabbing in Spanish and God, she just looks fabulous. Mm -hmm. uh, so then quickly she's like, oh, wait a minute, the gun. So now she's thinking she's going to do some type of a murder mystery. Right. And uh, so the, this is when the characters start talking back and they're like, oh, that sounds stupid to me. Well, someone took the bullets out of the gun. Well, who's the killer? Well, who's the victim? What's the motive? And Natalie's like, I got to figure this out. You got to give me a minute. And Joe pulls out an hourglass and says, OK, but that's all you got. Yeah. Boom. Here's a minute. Again, very Yosemite Sam or something. You yeah. Know? Like if Bugs was like, hey, give me a minute. You know, yeah. <laughs> like, okay, pulls out an hour glass. Yeah. I have an hour glass, Doc. Dramatic sting. And that's where we go to commercial. And then after the commercial, we come back to pretty much the same thing in progress. Still, the girls are bored and trying to leave. They're not themselves. Uh, in the syndicated version, by the way, they usually chop out three minutes it looks like the majority of what was chopped out of this is when Tootie comes in and sits down and starts telling her tales of adventure, of flying and being in Pago Pago and then rescuing a guy. 
what you see in the version that's on Daily Motion, there's just less of it. It's a longer story from Tootie. Thank uh, God. Yeah. <laughs> so when we come back from commercial, we're kind of still doing more of the same. And uh, yeah, this is where the girls are acting bored and they're like, Ugh, we're just going to, we're leaving. And she's like, you can't leave because the bridge is washed out. And that's where Clooney comes in and uh, in the bus driver's uniform. And later there's a point where he just interjects a comment and someone says, do you even need to be here? And Natalie goes, no, but he looks so cute in the uniform. Yes. And then, and then the, the, the tag joke in the episode, which is fast forward a little further, gets no laugh from the audience where Clooney comes in in the officer in a gentleman way, which if they could have licensed love, lift us up where we belong, they would have mm. used it there. Um, and if Clooney could have lifted her, um, and <laughs> <laughs> sorry, the joke, had just walked into it. Wow. Um, but wow. he throws his hat and then it comes back to him like a boomerang. No, nothing, nothing from the audience. Yeah. I, I, I'm not convinced that there is an audience anymore. I know David likes to say that it's a live audience, but some of the laughs just sound so canned and so like, ah, and perfect in time. It just, I don't know. I'm not convinced that there's a, there's a live audience for well, it. Paul Provenzo, when I had him on, um, he was still the warm up comic at this time uh, and, and says there was. Oh, then somebody was falling asleep at the applause button. Or yeah. Something. Yeah, my argument is if if there if they were sweetening the laughs, then why didn't we have a laugh on Clooney yeah. throwing the hat and the hat getting thrown back at him? Because it was hilarious. And it's like, right. why is there no if, if they're gonna use a laugh track, fucking use it. Yes. And yeah, but but at the same time, I there are other moments where I, I cannot I don't really know. I'm just going by my instinct and observation, and God knows that has been wrong many times. <laughs> throughout my life uh and in between these two things Clooney at one point walks in dressed as a bus boy and he's just yes. like yeah so uh, you need me to bus any more of the tables and one of the girls says wait a minute weren't we the bus driver before and Natalie to justify this says to him and, and he actually goes to her yeah wait a minute like he himself is confused and Natalie says don't worry you're moonlighting he's like oh <laughs> yeah I'm moonlighting and then leaves <laughs> Blair, Lisa Welchel, as the mysterious woman, starts adopting a weirder and weirder character walk. Very much. And, and there is some fun physical bits. There's one point where she is confronting Joe and they're doing this Blair bends forward while Joe bends back. Yes. As they, as they proceed across the, the restaurant. And, and that's, again, more of the cartoonish craziness. It's very Wabbit season. Yeah. <laughs> and um, she's also he, filing her nails with her gloves on. And <laughs> I'm not sure that there is a cigarette in her cigarette holder. Nope, there is so. not. There is a pork chop in her hand. Yeah, when she goes for the gun, there's a pork chop in her hand. And at the beginning, when we first meet Blair, the, the joke is the mysterious woman. She was looking for something. And Lisa Welchel is doing fucking amazing physical work yeah and she's looking around like looking under the napkin holder and looking at this and she picks up her coffee cup and turns it over and is looking at the bottom and then she asks natalie to hand her the sugar and uh, they make a bit out of her putting a fuck ton of sugar in her cup and then she pretends to drink out of it and it's like well okay only in the context of this episode can i let you get away with that <laughs> right because i have a peeve as far as actors with cups that clearly have no liquid in them. So Lisa Welch is doing some great physical stuff. In particular, her uh, elegant, mysterious lady walk is getting really broad in the second act of the show. And uh, I am here for it. And then the story starts to evolve in that uh, a letter appears and the mysterious woman is trying to intercept it, but it's actually addressed to the waitress and it's a rich man has left her a million dollars in his yes. will. And then the best reveal, the moment I kind of have to admit, I was surprised by when Joe, the waitress says, um, well, you can't shoot me and inherit all the money since the mysterious woman is obviously the long lost daughter of the millionaire. 
And she says, why? She says, because I'm a cop. And she says, well, if you're a cop, then who's the waitress? And in comes Mrs. Garrett, also dressed as a waitress, plate of cookies. Hello. And this is when she's starting to pull back from being in every episode. So bingo. Yeah. And so it, I, it's yeah. I have to admit, I I did have a, oh, that's right. She's still on the show. This isn't a, we did have some Mrs. Garrett list shows last season and the girls carried them just fine. And this was clearly feeling like one of those shows. And then when Mrs. Garrett came in, that was, for me, it was a genuine surprise. And and I'm sorry, Charlotte Ray dressed as the waitress with a tray of cookies. It was, she's just so fucking perfect. adorable. It's perfect. Adorable. So the gun is handed around back and forth. And then with all of these confessions and uh, the, the will and Tootie as the pilot being third in line somehow mysteriously. So she wants to shoot the others and she'll inherit the money. But the cop, Joe, was there to protect Mrs. Garrett, the waitress. And then Natalie kind of comes up with the great denouement. The guy forgot to sign the check. Yeah. Dun, dun, dun. An O. Henry-esque twist. <laughs> and all of them, all the characters in the story are like, oh, come the fuck on. Really? <laughs> Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. But it's like their, their reaction is, oh, you don't expect us to buy that. Come on. So they basically walk out angry. They hate the ending. They think it's terrible. Tootie doesn't hate it. She's like, I think it was kind of inspired. But yeah. And then that's where Natalie is left alone. And she says, and they who had met by chance went elsewhere to seek their fortunes. The end. Oh, wait a minute. And that's where we get The Officer and a Gentleman, which was a movie from 1982. Full Richard Gere, naval mm. officer uniform. God, mm. he is sexy. Mm. Jesus. Mm. Good looking dude. Thick yeah. it. In Richard Gear, put me in gear. Richard Gere. <laughs> I you want see, you to treat my head like a stick shift and move it around <laughs> until I'm in fifth gear. Richard <laughs> Gear, I'm sorry. Um, I okay. What, what's the clutch? Mm. Remind. We'll show you later, Ken. After okay, we're done enough. with the call, we'll show you. Later. I can't share my screen right now. So I can't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now this is the most interesting question, uh, Ken. I'm most curious to hear your answer. Uh, Richard Gear or George Clooney? Clooney. Matthew Gere is Gear has uh, no personality. <laughs> yeah, Gear is charm free. I'll give you. Yeah. Um, and uh, well, I mean, are we talking George Clooney in 1985 or George? Not that it matters because it's going to be George Clooney. Any either year of Clooney. Thank, yeah, yeah. Even even to Clooney, I, I mean, to me, there's no contest. But you know, people have their opinions. But I'm mm-hmm. like, yeah, Clooney all the way. Gear was. Gear was fine. We loved him because he took his clothes off a lot in his movies. But he has and- doll eyes. <laughs> like just dead doll. Like Donald Pleasant should be describing his eyes like he's Michael Myers. <laughs> dead doll eyes. You're absolutely right. <laughs> yes, you're totally right. You're totally right. And yet, yeah. But how many VHS tapes did we wear out? Like of Breathless, of of the movies where you got three frames of Richard Gere's peen. Cause in the eighties, we got nothing. All your teen comedies showed all the tits and uh, we gays yeah. got nothing. We got Tom Cruise and all the right moves. Mm-hmm. Wore out that VHS. Uh, you got Mark uh, Skippy price in trick or treat. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> the, the fuckability factor, not as high. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But okay, so Ken, you would totally, if you were given the chance to have sex with Clooney or Richard Gere, you'd pick Clooney also. If I had to pick, I'd pick Clooney, yeah. Yeah, cool. All right. <laughs> that, that, in the words of, um, uh, as Kevin Pollack on his chat show, he'd say, uh, that is the correct answer. <laughs> <laughs> So that's how uh, the whole episode ends. And then we do the wonderful thing where just as Clooney leaves and the big flourish of industrial prepaid music winds down, cut to the original waitress. Anything else you need, hon? And then Natalie says, no, you know, you've got one happening place here. And the waitress is like, Okay, I'm confused because I don't know what just happened here. And then Natalie grabs her bag 
walks past the sign and then we end as we started with a close up on the sign Bernie's Truck Stop Cafe. It's not the best episode in the season. Uh, no, oh god no. No no no. This is when we're in those seasons I I say it every week. This where it's just it's just a fun episode. I'm sorry. And like I had no notes because that story is ridiculous and Natalie writing the characters and everything. Everything's so fucking non sequitur and ridiculous. Like it's like trying to take notes on an on a Warner Brothers cartoon. That is a perfect, perfect example, Ken. Is it's like a Warner Brothers cartoon. And it makes you go, and it's definitely not intentional, but it it puts a a a lens on the rest of the series where Natalie so desperately wants to be a writer and you're like, she's not very good. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, but it's almost like that. That's part of like, we know, we all know. <laughs> <laughs> Even though she ends up becoming a writer and producer at CNN, that's where Natalie green ends up in the reunion movie. Yes. Not, I buy that. That's... Also, she's not a very good writer. Yeah, well, that's why she ended up they're like, can we, can we promote you to produce or we think you'd be better producing? But but again, fits in with the reporter thing. Mm-hmm. Yep, exactly. It's all it's all connected back to more journalism versus creative writing. Uh, and I there is definitely a, a high enjoyability factor when you get to see the actresses do things that they don't normally get to do. In particular, Nancy McKeon playing the waitress and looking as she does with the big teased up hair, no mullet and all that. And definitely Lisa Welch is having a blast. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She's chewing the scenery big time. And and knows that she can get away with it, knows that this is the place to do it. She's tapping into her Mickey Mouse Club uh, years. (laughs) So true. It's anything can happen day here. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Ken Reed, I I am so like still starstruck by you, and I just I, <laughs> I can't tell you how much I love your podcast. Who is your favorite guest that you've had on? Oh, geez, because um, I love how you always drop names. Like I know I try not to, but it comes no, up. It's hilarious. You know, to own up. it. Because you're like friend of the show, dear friend, dear yep. friend. Yeah. Show. Oh, Jane I Seymour. That's right. Oh, my dear friend, Jane Seymour. Yes, yeah. yeah. Jane Seymour was great. Um, probably Bonnie Hunt. That's the biggest one. Oh, you yeah. You love just, Bonnie Hunt. Love her. She's amazing. Um, and just so cool. And and yeah, or Cassandra Peterson. Amazing. Those Who's are the t- Sandra Peterson. Cassandra Peterson is Elvira. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. okay. Um, oh, yeah. Those, that was a good are, one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Damned, obviously, because they're just such a huge, uh, huge influence on my my life um joe Can brand was really fun oh yes joe brand was great Loved and her. i i messaged oh. you about that one on yes. instagram because i was like how does that feel as a fucking comedian to make joe brand laugh yeah and you did oh it's it's ridiculously satisfying <laughs> oh she's so fucking fantastic she's so joe cool brand. yeah well, during the pandemic, Ken, as all of us have, we've had to change our podcasts to being a home-based business. And uh, I've got to say, I still love your shows. It's transitioned, I feel, very smoothly. Uh, and now that the pandemic is on the slowly on the outs and we can start traveling, uh, I'm sure you're really looking forward to getting back to hosting your panels at the cons and visiting some celebrities in LA. Do you have a trip planned? Hopefully. Um, yeah, I'm thinking like maybe the end of October again, I'm going to, uh, kind of feel it out and see. So it's, uh, yeah, it's definitely been good in that it's opened up like a lot of places I've never traveled to. Mm -hmm. Um, so I could interview people from there, but yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I'm hoping like in the fall. Cool. Well, come to Florida sometime. Come and see us. Yeah, for sure. We'd love to have you here. <laughs> well, Ken, thank you so much for giving us the time. Happy July 4th, by the way. We're recording this on Independence Same Day. Same to you. Same to you. Sir, due to a uh, series of fortunate events, because no matter what happens, I love whenever I get you on the show. And uh, let's do this again really, really soon. Yeah, looking forward to it. Thank you. All right. We'll talk at you soon. Bye. You're my favorite person. I love you. What? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> There you have it. That was Ken Reed. Thank you so much to him for being on the show again. If you aren't listening to his excellent podcast, TV Guidance Counselor, you really should be. If you like this show, chances are you're going to like his too. 
Also, thank you to Diana Eden for giving us a little bit of insight regarding the costuming. Don't forget, her book is still available at Amazon.com, Stars in Their Underwear. I will put the link in the show notes. Next week, we're going to be watching Season 7, Episode 9, Born Too Late. And our guest is going to be the amazingly talented and fun, Summer Aiello. You can watch the show ahead of time for free at dailymotion.com and now the Roku channel. I will post the link to both of those in the show notes and on this episode's webpage. That is all for now. Thank you so much for listening to this week's show. And remember, the facts of life are all about you. Let's Face the Facts was created, produced, written, hosted, and edited by the wonderful David Almeida. Our theme song was beautifully arranged and recorded by Ned Wilkinson. Please visit facethefactspod.com for supplemental photos and videos, links to social media, and ways that you can support the show. And don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. This is Matthew Arder saying tune in again next week for another thrilling episode of Let's Face the Facts.